Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about things that can go wrong with your immune system. That's right, you know, not everything can go perfectly for the body, and the truth is, a lot of times, you know, we take our our health for granted, but, you know, things that can go wrong, uh, and that's when we're going to want to seek out some attention, for either from the uh, pharmacy, if it's something mild, like for example, allergies, or we want to seek some help from a, from a trained physician if it's something more serious, like an autoimmune disease or an auto or an immune deficiency. And so that's what this particular video is going to be about. It's going to describe a little bit about allergies. Uh, we've all uh, probably experienced that, and then we're sort of ratcheted up to um, autoimmune diseases that can, can have our own white blood cells, how do you like that, attacking our own normal tissue. And then when our whole immune system just isn't working well at all, um, that, that's a more serious and potentially fatal problem. And so we'll go from, from something that, that uh, is minor to something major. So a uh, picture here of a, of a flower. Here's the uh, sticky stigma, and here's the uh, anthers here, and the male structure is called stamen, and here are the ever-present pollen which is the uh, male gametophyte for those botany experts out there. So the thing is, uh, malfunctions can occur. So this, is, this particular video is about uh, abnormal immune function. And so why, why show the pollen? Well, our body reacts to pollen. When pollen gets into the body, it reacts to it as if it's, it's foreign. Uh, and it is foreign, but it treats it as if it's a pathogen, which is a disease-causing agent such as like a fungus or a bacteria, a virus, a protozoan, something like that. But in fact, it's not a pathogen. It's simply an allergen. It's something that's going to invoke an allergic reaction, which is basically an inflammatory reaction. And so let's get into that uh, conversation. So, you know, here's some of the culprits, because this is uh, pictures of po different kinds of pollen under the scanning electron micrograph. And so you can see the pollen that we could see here without the aid of a microscope. It's sort of just yellow powder. But when you look at it under the uh, scanning electron microscope, you'll see these really unusual structures. And to me, uh, pollen looks a lot like vi a virus. And so you can see how this would be interpreted by the body as being dangerous. And so these are foreign uh, uh, structures that are coming into the body and the immune system is going to contend with that. And so uh, these are called allergies. And so they could be minor. They could be things like we've all had hay fever. We, and s symptoms are like red, red, red eyes, runny, uh, itchiness, um, runny nose, uh, eczema, hives, this sort of thing. And so these are some of the symptoms of my, minor allergies. Now, allergies could ratchet it up. You may not consider this minor. Like if you've ever had hives before, you're like, this is not minor. This is a major problem. And so you might want to have this uh, looked into. But, you know, here's the thing. How does the physician know what is causing the allergy? Well, they can do a variety of things. They could, you know, the most, the simplest sort of thing is, is, uh, uh, a lot of physicians will have a uh, sort of a sampling of different allergens, which are uh, things that cause the allergies, and, and little little tiny um, needles that give uh, just simple uh, skin pricks. And if your body is uh, is showing some redness to that, then that's possibly the culprit. And so um, sometimes it's something in the environment that's causing the allergy. Sometimes it's a dietary allergy. You may have heard of that. Something. Sometimes it's a it's an allergy to certain kinds of medications, whatever it may be, but it can be major in terms of, like, for example, if you have widespread, uh, if you have widespread, um, uh, it's called anaphylaxic shock, and and this has to do with uh, an inflammatory response. But if all of the blood vessels in your body become uh, super dilated all at once, that that's a lot of flow from the blood into the tissue fluid, which will result in low pre blood pressure and it could possibly uh, lead to death. And so it's rather serious. Uh, it can be. And so um, this <laughs> this is pretty scary. Like This is a dust, a dust mite. And so this is under the scanning electron micrograph. So 
maybe maybe we're allergic to this guy. Maybe we're uh, allergic to, to pollen and other sorts of things or food. But nevertheless, let's get into what is an allergy in the first place. What causes these symptoms? And so, um, you know, here here's another. These are all your favorite things. This is a wasp. And so, you know, again, people can be allergic to wasps as well. And so this or bee sting or any sort of like uh, venom uh, can can invoke a very severe uh, reaction. It can be a severe allergy or it could be like anaphylactic shock, as I was mentioning before. And so the beginnings of this allergy have to come from uh, an antibody. And so an antibody, uh, for those of you who are, are new to this conversation, an antibody is a protein. It's an immunoglobulin, meaning that it, it's part of our immune system. B cells produce it. So B cells produce this particular one is, is important in, in, in an allergic reaction. Okay, you notice here it has heavy chain and light chain, and this is the, the area that's uh, variable right in here, the binding site. And so immunoglobulin E is one of the, one of the guys. And so here is the cell that secretes uh, antibodies, which is a B lymphocyte. And so it's sometimes called a plasma cell because it pumps up really large and it secretes antibodies, which are these Y-shaped proteins, and they get secreted in our uh, fluids of our body, so our humors. So it's sometimes known as humoral immunity, antibody secretion. And so as it turns out, hay fever occurs when these plasma cells uh, secrete this antibody, which is immunoglobulin E, for the pollen. And so what will happen is a lot of this will attach onto pollen, but see, here's the thing, the pollen's not a threat. The pollen's not gonna hurt us in any way, so it's sort of uh, inert. And so there's sometimes excess amount of immunoglobulin E that is circulating, and that is going to lead to the fact that the immunoglobulins don't attach only to the pollen grains, but they attach to this cell called a mast cell. And this cell is kind of common in, in, in uh, connective tissue. What you're seeing is just the nucleus. So I'll sort of draw in the cell right here like that. And so what's going to happen is the, these antibodies are going to attach to the mast cell without binding to the pollen. And you're like, okay, well, what's that going to do? Well, here's another picture of the mast cell, another picture of the mast cell. Again, I'm not seeing anything that you're not, but this is just the nucleus. And so these antibodies are basically attaching right here to these mast cells. This is the immunoglobulin E. And you're like, well, what, what gives with it? Well, a little background on the mast cell. The mast cell contains little granules, okay? So these granules inside. And you're like, well, I wonder what these granular, granules are. Those granules that are, as you can see in this micrograph here, these granulars that are, that are inside of a mast cell are histamines. That's right, histamines. Okay, so here we go. So here's the pollen right here from hay fever. And when it enters the body, basically what it's gonna be doing is the pollen then becomes attached to these antibodies on the surface of the mast cells. I'll sort of animate this. And so here you can have more and more pollen attaching and attaching and attaching to the mast cell. And what the mast cell is doing is that it's going to be releasing, as you can see in this sort of this white cloud right here, it's gonna be releasing a chemical called a histamine. That's right, and so here's more pollen attaching here to the antibodies associated onto a mast cell. And so those attachments of the allergen to the immunoglobulin E on the mast cell causes what's known as a release or a degranulate. It degranulates the mast cell. So as you can see, these chemicals are coming out and these chemicals are largely histamines, but there are other agents as well. And so histamines are what cause an inflammatory response mostly. And so what does this mean? This involves like a lot of dilation of blood vessels. So there's a lot of fluid to a particular area and causes redness and itching and, and heat to a particular area. Those are all the 
symptoms of an inflammation. Now, normally, just want to point it out, normally inflammation is a good response. Think about that. It allows white blood cells to get out into the tissue fluid more readily and fight off an infection. But if this is not an infection, this is not something that's going to hurt us. This is not a pathogen. This is an allergen. So an inflammatory response is just cumbersome and a nuisance. And so, you know, we, we generally don't like it. We don't like allergies. And so, uh, you know, the histamines are released and it's going to uh, result in inflammatory response. And so there's a potpourri of antihistamines that sort of diminish these uh, allergic-like symptoms because antihistamines are going to block receptors for histamine and therefore reduce these sort of inflammatory typical symptoms. It's, it reduces sneezing, running nose, sounds like a commercial, tearing, and it and basically these these uh, these medications are pretty effective. Just saying, and that uh, you know you could purchase these, and some of them are can be purchased in a, in a drugstore. Some of them can be prescription if your allergies are very severe. And so I mentioned, you know, an allergic response is irritating in, in one respect, but it can be life-threatening in another because if we have, and I mentioned this before, a wide spread, like in other words, if we were to eat something or a wasp bites us or something like we have a real severe food allergy that, that can be fatal because if a widespread number of mast cells are degranulating all at once. It causes an abnormal amount of dilation of the circulatory blood vessels, which can result in a major drop in pressure. Death can occur in a few minutes. So this is real serious. And so some of the things that one can do if you know that you have a major food allergy or if you're vulnerable in some way to a bee sting or if you're allergic to penicillin, or there's a variety of things that can cause anaphylactic shock. Usually what these individuals will do is that they'll carry a, uh, a syringe with them of epinephrine, and sometimes it's simply called an EpiPen. And this could be like literally punctured into, into the leg of an individual who's experiencing an anaphylactic shock. And it basically will reverse some of the symptoms of, of um, this of inflammation, basically causing blood vessels to constrict and increase breathing, that sort of thing. And it might buy you a few minutes so that you can, uh, somebody can call 911 and get a paramedic there uh, to help you out. But basically, here's my advice is to avoid these things, you know, if you're, uh, if you're se severely allergic to them. So now I want to talk about the last two topics. In addition to allergies, I want to talk about autoimmune disease and, and then immune suppressant kinds of diseases. And so these are more severe. So an autoimmune is exactly what it sort of sounds like. It's a self-immune problem. And that means when our immune system, it's so impressive, it's so awesome, the lymphocytes and how they're so specific and they're fighting off all of these, these millions of different germs over a lifetime. But, and, and how can they do it? They can tell the difference between our own cells and foreign cells, and they do that by identifying major histocompatibility complexes on the outside of cells and antigen surfaces. But sometimes the white blood cell just doesn't get it right, and it turns on our own cells. And if our own white blood cells, and this is often a cell-mediated kind of thing, a T cell, if our own cells attack our own tissue, there's, that's trouble, and so sometimes that occurs. One of, and just go through a few of these. One of them is lupus. And this is when uh, the immune system generates, in this case, uh, B cells, generates antibodies against self molecules, uh, including histamines. And so there's uh, characterized as uh, rashes, fever, arthritis, and sort of even kidney dysfunction. So this can be kind of serious. Lupus, and it's an autoimmune disease. Um, you may have heard of this, rheumatoid arthritis is uh, very painful and, it, and it's basically damage to cartilage uh, that we usually find at the ends of bones in our joints, articular cartilage. It's when our own immune cells are attacking our cartilage cells and it results in, in trouble. And then this could be really serious as well. Uh, insulin dependent diabetes, type 1 diabetes is when um, our, this is a picture of 
you recognize your histology, this is a uh, the pancreas, and uh, these particular cells right here are called the islets of Langerhans, and there's alpha and beta cells, and these are the ones that produce hormones. These hormones are endocrine hormones that regulate blood sugar, and in particular, the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans produce insulin, which helps to lower blood glucose, and that's pretty pretty important. And so. Our own immune system attacks those cells and destroys it. So individuals that have uh, in insulin-dependent diabetes um, have an autoimmune disease, which is just simply called diabetes, and is, they're not producing enough insulin, which is brutal. And then here's another one, not to just keep piling on, but these are pretty common. MS, multiple sclerosis, is a, is a, is a very common and chronic neurological disease, and it's basically when our T cells so these are our T lymphocytes. They come and attack the myelin sheath that surrounds our neurons. If you're familiar with the anatomy of a neuron, this is a, 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 a Schwann cell that wraps around, and this is sort of a lip, lipid-like material that helps insulate neurons. And so um, this could be real serious, and, it, and there's a lot of uh, neurological abnormalities that result from MS. So I, I welcome you to, if you're interested in any of these, just to the, just keeping the video uh, l length in mind, you, you're more than welcome to investigate each one of these uh, autoimmune disorders uh, more thoroughly uh, using the internet. And then finally, uh, immune deficiency syndrome. Now this is, they're very serious in terms of like scale of, of trouble because if your immune system is deficient, that means that you're basically vulnerable to every possible pathogen that's out there. And so this is a real serious. So this is, means like it could either mean your humoral or your cell-mediated mediated immunity is compromised, meaning like antibody production for B cells or being able to, to fight against um, cells that, that are being already infected by viruses or, or cancer. From T cells do a great job regulating that. And so one example of immune deficiency is something called SCIDS. And so this is called Severe Combined Immune Deficiency, or SCID, just for short. So it's a disease that basically um, uh, interferes with your immune system and it won't function properly. And, and then, you know, what the problem with this is, is that it requires bone marrow transplant and, it, and it, um, in order to get functioning lymphocytes to occur. And so there's a lot of attempts uh, using gene therapy to sort of combat this. A gene therapy is, is incorporating, just real briefly, it's kind of complicated, it's incorporating a virus and it's co-opting some of the things that a virus does best, which is attach to cells and inject uh, nucleic acid. And so we're trying to use viruses to inject correct genes into uh, bone marrow tissue in order to get uh, functioning back. Uh, to order, and so one of the, the th one of the things about uh, skids is that it's sometimes called boy in the bubble disease. You may have heard of this story before because in the 1970s and 80s, there was a, a young boy uh, who lived for 12 years in a, in a in a basically in a bubble in this sort of germ-free environment, or else he would have died. His name was David Vetter, and so. Uh, this is a, a problem, and so this is associated with the X chromosome right here, and so that's sort of it's a genetic disorder as well. And then um, another brutal one is that um, immune deficiencies can af occur later in your life. In other words, certain cancers can can manifest and, and suppress the immune system. So. One of there's many different types of cancers, but one of the one of the ones that are particularly brutal is something called Hodgkin's disease, or sometimes known as lymphoma, and so it sometimes can be characterized by swollen lymph nodes, but it basically is a cancer that ultimately disrupts the immune system and therefore uh, leaves you vulnerable to any kinds of infections, and then uh, lastly, one of the most deadliest viruses the world has ever known. Um, HIV, shown here in this uh, transmission electron micrograph, basically what it does is it infects, it's a virus that infects our T helper cells in particular, 
and it ultimately destroys our T cells, which are sort of the heart of the communication system of our immune system. And so it compromises our immune system, so it results in a uh, disease that I think everyone is familiar with called AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. So the virus is usually transmitted sexually or through blood. And without those T cells, we're vulnerable to all sorts of pathogens, particularly pneumonia as a killer. So that, that's, that's pretty unfortunate. And so I um, hope you enjoyed this video on abnormal immune function, which can be something minor from an allergy to something major. So hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.